Well, thank you, Joe, and, uh, and the program committee for offering me the opportunity to come and speak over here. It was a real delight earlier this year when Joe uh, and this conference really, uh, we were able to run a parallel conference in Houston with our annual minimally invasive um, meeting. So I've been asked to speak about the AngioVac, and um, let's start with a case. You've got a 70-year-old man who had a traumatic injury, spinal injury, and developed a deep vein thrombosis. An IVC filter was placed, anticoagulation was started, and an adequate INR was achieved. Two weeks later, he had severe painful swelling of both legs and ascites, and a vascular surgical evaluation revealed bilateral phlegmasia, and a CT angiogram was obtained, which showed that he had complete thrombosis of his IVC. This is the IVC filter that's in place. Too much feedback? Yeah. Um, so here you see the IVC filter in place. Um, and below it, the inferior vena cava is completely clotted off. An angiovac was used, and you see the device being, uh, being uh, placed over here from the left, uh, left common femoral vein. Uh, and this is what the angiogram looked like before the angiovac evacuation. And this is what was obtained from the inferior vena cava um, here. Um, and this was the completion angiogram showing a wide open inferior vena cava. Now, venous thromboembolism is a big problem. Many of you know about this. There's over 300,000 people that die every year in the United States uh, as a result of venous thromboembolism. Um, uh, it's, it's really topped only by heart disease and by cancer. This is an example of a pulmonary embolus um, that, uh, that uh, is seen on a CT scan, which of course is one of the most uh, devastating uh, consequences of venous thromboembolism. And the pathophysiology of pulmonary embolism is basically related to uh, right ventricular uh, dilatation um, and right ventricular wall tension, uh, both of which conspire uh, to ultimately lead to systemic arterial hypotension. A surgical embolectomy um, is a traumatic procedure, and this is a, an example of a pulmonary embolism uh, being withdrawn from the patient's uh, pulmonary artery. And uh, essentially what it involves is placing a patient on cardiopulmonary bypass, um, opening up the pulmonary artery and extracting the clot. Now, it's a very traumatic procedure and is usually performed in patients who are in extremis. For patients who have got less severe uh, forms of, uh, of uh, pulmonary embolism, and even for patients who are in extremis, there was a search for less invasive ways to treat them. Thrombolytic therapy obviously came on the scene many years ago, but the limitations are that it only works on fresh clot. But all patients with venous thromboembolism will have some chronic component. And up to 50% of patients will have a contraindication uh, because of a bleeding risk. There's about a 10 to 15% risk of major bleeding um, and involves up to 72 hours infusion with repeat trips to the cath lab. Catheter treatment of pulmonary embolism, which is achieved primarily by two main, uh, uh, well, three main means now. Uh, one is the angiojet, the other is the ECOS catheter, which is an ultrasound uh, uh, catheter, which has an ultrasound tip that helps to break up the clot, and the other is a pigtail, um, uh, have had modest clinical success. They use thrombolytics as adjuvants in, uh, in the vast majority of them, but the mortality rates are high because these patients are so sick. And the fundamental of obstacles are that these are small catheters which don't permit the removal of a large clot burden. You use a larger catheter and you lead to a lot of blood loss which the patients don't tolerate very well. So surgical pulmonary embolectomy enjoyed a revival in the early part, um, in, in the early 2000s, really in 2002, 2003 at the Brigham Hospital. And really, 
Prior to this, the operation was declared a failure before the incision was made, because regardless of the results, if it was successful, you would say, well, it was unnecessary, it shouldn't have been done. And if it was unsuccessful, everybody would say, well, it was futile, why did you bother? And this was usually because up until the last 10 years ago, surgeons would usually only operate on patients with PE if those patients were extremely sick, in many cases often moribund. Um, Lishan Aklog um, and others at the Brigham uh, decided to take a different approach and began operating on patients who were not in extremis, but nevertheless who had a significant clot burden with evidence of right ventricular dysfunction. Part of the rationale for this was the growing realization that chronic pulmonary thromboembolic disease was a serious problem that was being under-recognized. And the way to minimize that risk was to treat aggressively acute pulmonary embolism up front. And they, in fact, had excellent results um, with excellent long-term survival. And this led to an approach which is now uh, um, uh, something that is more or less standard, and that is that if patients have echo evidence of right ventricular dysfunction, even in the presence of relatively normal hemodynamics and a demonstrated central clot burden, and we'll talk about that in just a moment, pulmonary embolectomy is a procedure which is performed much more commonly now. Um, there are two types of uh, massive pulmonary emboli which can occur. There's the central or type A, uh, which you see on the left over here, um, and, um, and there's the type B, where the clot has in fact migrated a little bit further out. And it's no surprise that the patients in the type A category uh, will do much better uh, with a pulmonary embolectomy as long as you don't wait till they're almost dead. Now, the lessons that we learned from catheter and surgical treatment were that these clots are large. And on-block extraction is critical because Fragmentation sends clots downstream into the small branch vasculature and leads to the chronic effects that we talked about. But on-block extraction requires a large bore cannula, and the current limitation of that is blood loss. So the initial concept of the Angevac, which was developed by Lishan Aklog, the primary author of that paper, Lishan got together with Brian de Guzman and a few others, and they actually brainstormed and came up with a concept to develop a minimally invasive targeted mechanical treatment to a local mechanical problem of pulmonary embolism. This was what the driving force was, and it's a little ironic, and you'll see why uh, uh, later on, but the driving force was to treat PE. So the idea was to provide all of the benefits of a surgical embolectomy without the trauma of an open cardiac surgical procedure and create a better alternative to thrombolytic therapy. So the idea was to use a large bore cannula, place suction on it to engage and remove an undesirable intravascular material, UIM, and have a trap, an emboli trap, to capture the UIM. And this was what differentiated it, to have simultaneous reinfusion of filtered blood. So they developed a large bore 22 French um, uh, cannula here uh, with a proprietary funnel tip uh, which opens up when, it's, uh, when a balloon is inflated uh, using an endoflator. The balloon itself doesn't occlude the vessel but it improves the flow rates and it engages and conforms the material larger than the cannula ID. It's a simple veno-veno extracorporeal circuit with no reservoir. There's a centrifugal pump. I keep losing the cursor, yeah. There is a, uh, there's a, there's a centrifugal pump um, with an inline filter, um, and it's transparent, so you get immediate visual feedback, and you have real-time reinfusion of shed blood. And of course, what that means is you maintain hemodynamic stability and you preserve the patient's blood volume. They tested it out in an animal model, and uh, even in an animal model with a right atrial embolus in transit. Um, and uh, they did uh, bench testing on it and showed that at up to 5,000 RPM, you had a steady increase in the flow rate without any fall off for the 22 French design. 
they also showed that the uh, that the uh, uh, that the cannula pressures uh, uh, became progressively more negative as you as you as you increase the flow. Um, and at the RP, at about 3,500 RPM, they found that. Uh, when you got to within five centimeters of the clot, there was enough suction there to just suck the clot into it. So the maneuvers are fairly straightforward. Uh, what you do is you advance the cannula up to or near uh, where the clot is, flush the filter and repeat imaging to check your position, uh, deploy the funnel, and then initiate an optimized flow. They received FDA clearance in, uh, in 2009 for the cannula and an expanded indication uh, just March of last year uh, for, um, uh, for on-block removal of undesirable intravascular material as well as to facilitate flow. So they have an FDA clearance for use as a venous drainage cannula, although it's, it is uh, uh, pretty unheard of to use it for just that purpose since it's a pretty expensive cannula. And, and, and for the use of, uh, and, and it's also approved for use for the removal of fresh soft thrombi and emboli. That's what the circuit looks like. Um, you've got uh, a catheter, you've got three eight inch standard pump tubing, inflow tubing, um, a TUE guide wire and port, which is the latest iteration of it, uh, a Y connector up there, filter that's built into it, and a rotor flow pump with return tubing that sends, uh, that sends the uh, blood back into the patient. So the method of insertion is you get guide wire access to your target site, do an angiogram and or TEE, and we prefer to do both. Insert the angiovac cannula. You can do it percutaneously versus open. Uh, it does take a 26 French dry seal sheath, which is what we used, uh, which is what we use routinely. Um, the, uh, the approach can be from the IJ or from the femoral. Femoral access is preferred. Um, and the reinfusion cannula, which we typically insert through the IJ, is a 16 to 18 French uh, biomedicus arterial cannula. 17 French is what I typically use. Then you connect them up to the circuit, and that's what the, uh, 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 that's what the tip looks like when it's inserted, and when you expand the balloon, the tip opens up into a funnel shape. Obviously, as you're advancing it over an introducer, you want the tip to be closed so that you don't engage the vessel walls as you're, as you're advancing it, and you only open it up when you're near the target that you want to aspirate. So let me show you a case. Uh, well, we did two cases last Monday, just this Monday gone, and this is, and this is one of them. This is, a, this is a photograph of our hybrid room with a Siemens Zigo system. That's Cassidy Duran, who's one of our vascular fellows, who two days after this delivered her baby, she worked right up to the, to the very end. And this is the patient. This is a 45-year-old lady who had short bowel syndrome and had a, a central line for TPN, and over time developed a mass associated with the tip of this line and developed candidemia. She had a fungus infection and um, uh, she was extremely sick, and we had every reason to believe that this mass over here in the right atrium was a fungus ball. Um, very high risk patient. Um, she's, uh, she's had previous uh, arm amputation that was done because of trauma, has short bowel syndrome, like I mentioned, and really not somebody that we wanted to operate on uh, to remove uh, this with an open technique. This is the setup, it's a standard uh, setup that I showed you, and uh, this is her on the table uh, with, the, uh, with the tubing set up uh, for the angiovac. Uh, right femoral uh, puncture with a uh, 26 French dry seal sheath. Uh, right internal jugular puncture with a 17 French biomedicus cannula, uh, which is, uh, that's uh, 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 another view of that setup. Uh, insert the angiovac. Uh, hook it up, and this, in fact, has, has, has now improved since they now have a quick connect uh, in the latest model, which we don't have yet, um, which makes this part uh, much easier. And that's what the connected circuit looks like. Obviously, you have to be extremely careful to make sure that, that, uh, that there's no air that's trapped within the circuit. 
we, uh, we hooked her up. This was on Monday afternoon, uh, three or four days ago. And moments after we started, my fellow took this picture with the filter uh, clear and literally, and I can't, I, I don't have a way to show this to you because he didn't take a movie of it, but literally three seconds later, that's what we saw in the filter. Um, and um, and uh, when we retrieved it, and this was this sort of fragmentary material, which in fact was shown to be um, a, a fungus ball uh, by, uh, by pathology. Uh, this is the echo that was done immediately after that, showing complete evacuation of the mass and patients uh, doing fine. Now, first in man uh, for this was done at the Brigham uh, back and was published in 2011. Um, and a saddle pulmonary embolism was, uh, was also treated uh, the following year at the Mass General using this technique. And I don't think this is a particularly good device for PE yet, uh, which, is, uh, which I think will happen, but it's ironic, as I mentioned earlier, because that was the driving force uh, for the development of the device. And we'll talk about why it has limitations for that. Nevertheless, it has been used successfully in some instances for the removal of, of uh, pulmonary embolism. This is an example of an echo of a patient uh, in which there was a big, a large amount of clot that had broken off uh, from his leg and was circulating in the right atrium and was successfully removed with the angiovac, and there it is. Uh, it's been used uh, to remove um, um, uh, endocarditis vegetations from a prosthetic pulmonic valve, uh, which, is, uh, which is a great use of this product. And here is a large right atrial thrombus, which has also been evacuated with the, with the angiovac. This is a catheter right atrial thrombus, and I showed you an example of that in a patient of ours that we did on Monday. Very effective for removal of that. Uh, right atrial tumors can be removed. Uh, tricuspid vegetations, this is from Scott Goldman at Lankenau. Um, and uh, this is an example of a clot that formed on an ASD closure device, uh, which was removed using the, uh, uh, using the angiovac. So uh, intracable tumor and thrombus, patients with uh, renal uh, cell carcinoma that have extension into the inferior vena cava, uh, not infrequently will require a major operation with the participation of a cardiac surgeon, sometimes going on cardiopulmonary bypass with circ arrest even, to remove tumor thrombus that may have extended into the right atrium. This now provides a much easier alternative to that option by removing or evacuating everything that's in the inferior vein cava and the right atrium, uh, allowing the, uh, 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 the, uh, the urologist to proceed with a nephrectomy. Uh, very, very uh, uh, a good use of it is for limb-threatening DVT, May-Turner syndrome, which is an example of left iliofemoral deep vein thrombosis, which can uh, lead to phlegmasia, cerulea dolens, or limb-threatening um, um, a venous occlusion, and this is an example of that showing the occluded left iliac vein uh, with the angiovac, that's what was obtained and the iliac vein uh, was opened up. It's even been used now off-label in the arterial system, and this is an example just recently uh, of a thrombectomy that was performed from the uh, abdominal aorta. This slide is just meant to show that the patient maintained complete hemodynamic stability during the activation of the circuit because of the immediate reinfusion of any volume that was being removed. Um, we don't have any experience of using it um, in, the, in the arterial system, and it is an off-label indication, uh, but it has been used in several instances. So the spectrum, really, in which it can be used, really are right atrial masses, uh, vegetations, thrombi, tumor, uh, tricuspid valve, etc. the inferior vena cava, and we mentioned uh, examples of that. The arterial system, it has been used, very little experience with that, and uh, we'll see how that evolves. Pulmonary embolism, um, I put that on there because it has been used, but um, I will tell you that in our experience and, and in that of others, the device is really 
very difficult to steer. It's a stiff device which has a large funnel tip and it's difficult to negotiate it through the tricuspid valve and then through the pulmonic valve into the pulmonary arterial tree without risk of injury. Um, there have been some modifications that have been made and, uh, and I'll show you a couple of slides that may improve that, but I think this is an area where there does need to be improvement. Uh, we were concerned and we wanted to use it for PE, so in the lab, uh, Alan Lumsden, Brian and Matthias, colleagues of mine, uh, uh, used a cadaver model and basically with a sub xiphoid approach, put a purse string onto the right ventricular outflow tract uh, by elevating the sternum uh, using a hook type uh, 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 device. Um, and then advance the cannula, the angiovac cannula, directly into the uh, pulmonary artery by going through the right ventricular outflow tract uh, via a purse string. And, and they were able to show that it's, it's, it's a lot easier to do that. Uh, this has only just recently been done and we have not done it in, 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 a, in a person yet, uh, but the next opportunity we have, we do intend to uh, 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 use this technique. Um, the, the product enhancements that I talked about, there have been some changes which have improved this. Uh, there is now an angle tip that is available, which is about a 20 degree angulation, which ought to allow an easier um, uh, path through the tricuspid valve. We do not have access to this yet, and when we do, we'll certainly give it a, give it a shot. But I think the ability to navigate this over a wire and an introducer is really going to be a, be the advance that will help us manipulate it around curves and into the uh, pulmonary arterial tree. There is a working side port with a TUI insert as well, which makes things easier, and the quick connect that we talked about, which again, our circuits do not have, but hopefully as early as next week, we'll have them replaced with this, will make the, the whole business of connecting and disconnecting much easier. So I do think it's an important advance. It's most effective within the cava and the right atrium. It's best with, and, and not for pulmonary emboli, which was the driving force behind the evolution of the concept by these two cardiac surgeons. Uh, but I do think it's going to get there in the not too distant future. It's best with soft material. It, it does have a large bore and a stiff funnel tip, which is not steerable, even with the Hansen robot, which we have at our institution. We tried on Monday to do this, and we were unsuccessful. It makes it difficult to use for PE because of that, but a direct right ventricular outflow tract approach uh, may be easier, although it is untested in humans as yet. We've just done it in cadavers. I think greater flexibility of the tip and the ability to advance this over a wire would definitely help greatly. Thanks a lot.